thank you for coming today because I love to talk about fruit trees. I've got way too much information for you because some people know a lot, some people have never planted a tree before. So I'm going to try and hit the high spots. I'm going to talk fast. All the information on the slides is in your handout. The theme this year for Free the Seeds is recovery. That might be reusing, repurposing, composting, leading back into production. Another way is to close the seed gap. Plant the seeds you're given today. Let them go to seed. Collect the seed and donate it back again. It's easy to get started. They've got lots of resources for you. Now with fruit trees, we're not usually talking about planting a seed. Every single variety originally started from a seed, but you never know when you plant a seed if it's going to be something you want. It's just a big question mark, and it takes 7 to 12 years to find out. Some people do plant seeds. <laughs> but most people plant a grafted seed. I mean a grafted tree. They, they know what they want, whether it's a good eating apple or a terrific pie apple. They take a little tiny, you can see that, that little tiny stick, they take a, just a, a couple of buds and they graft it to their desired rootstock, grow it, get the tree they want. Also, grafted trees tend to bear younger than trees planted from seeds. People have been grafting and planting fruit trees for generations. And that's the reason that we have the possibility for so many wonderful varieties today. You have to have some genetic material to start that terrific new co cosmic crisp off of. We have some hundred year old orchards in the Flathead Valley. This is a picture of the 200 year old original, very first, Bramley seedling tree planted by a little girl in Britain. I have a Bramley seedling apple tree in my orchard. It was grafted off of another tree, off of another tree in succession, leading all the way back to this one single tree. The cycle continues as long as people graft and grow. You stop grafting those heirloom varieties, they'll disappear. My knowledge is based off of 27 years of planting and growing fruit trees in Mountain Brook, which is straight, straight against at the foot of the mountains. That's my orchard right there. Um, I don't worry about perfect fruit. I'm a hobby grower. I don't have to sell my fruit to anybody. Anything that's slightly flawed, I can make into applesauce, I can dry, I can squeeze for juice, I can make pies. Mm. Um, and also, I have a very definite bias when I grow. I don't like to spray. I don't spray. So some of the stuff you're going to hear today are going to be the, the non-spraying, the little bit more organic way of, of doing it. Today I'm going to cover the basics and then I'm going to talk about some of the individual fruits very briefly. Cover apples most, but then briefly talk about some of the other fruits that we can grow here in the valley. I don't have peaches up there. Um, I'm not successful with peaches. These are two books that I find helpful. This one's about, it was over 20 years old, but it's a great basic uh, introductory book on growing fruit trees. It was written by Bob Goff, who was a, a, a professor at Montana State University. And uh, there's a lot of introductory books out there, but this one gives you a lot more, and he's really great. Going beyond that, there's this book, The Holistic Orchard by Michael Phillips. It's an excellent view of holistic garden orcharding, the way I would like to grow my orchard. And then I think I've got, it, there's um, some more other good books that I like. And then this is from our Egg Extension Service. It's available free online. Our Egg Extension Service is a wonderful resource. Uh, almost everything they produce is available free online. And 
you, there's also egg extension services in places like Washington, California, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, they have, and all the other 50 states that have great resources, free, online. If you have a question, do a search. Okay, plants, once, once you plant that tree, it can't get up and move someplace better. You've got to give it the, your best site. <coughs> Fruit trees need at least, minimum, six to eight hours of sun a day in that growing season. Another factor to be aware of is the slope. There's not everybody, there's not a lot of level ground out there, at least where I am in Mountain Brook. And we often have to deal with the slope. The best, if you have a choice, sometimes you don't have a choice. I don't have a choice. Uh, full, the south facing slope is the best. Next would be the east. You can make do with the west. The north slope is just kind of a little trickier. You're not in the sun as much. I have a slight northwest facing slope. My trees have to work a little harder. Um, air drainage. Air drainage is important for fruit trees. If you don't have any air drainage, your, your fungi can really go to town. You want good air drainage. When you prune, you're going to prune so that the tree is open enough so that you get good air flow, dries the leaves. Also, cold air goes downhill. If it comes downhill and it meets a barrier, maybe a line of, you know, a wall of buildings or dense vegetation, then you get what, it'll pool behind it and make what's called a frost pocket. You might, you know, it's, it's critical in the early spring when you have those late frosts. I happen to, you know, you want it to flow on through. Maybe some openings there. In my orchard, I have air drainage over here and over here, but this is a wall. It's then on the neighbors, too. I can't do anything about it, even if I wanted to. So if I go out on a cold morning, I see frost on the ground. But I have apples down there. They can take it. I wouldn't put my apricots there. I put my apricots on higher ground. Think twice about planting close to a, to a building. Sometimes if you're on the south side of a building, you, you, it does give you that protected microclimate. But um, the building is taking up room where the tree's roots really need to grow. They're going to grow out further than what their branches show <laughs> above ground. Also, the, the, brand, the tree could be a, da a hazard to the building. I read when I was starting out that you could put apricots on the north side of a building and it would keep the ground frozen, delay your early spring bloom a little bit because apricots are first thing to bloom, the first to get wiped out by frost. I put them on the north side of the house. Well, it's lovely in the summer to pick apricots off the deck when you're eating breakfast. But I have a wood rot possibly even our malaria, it's going to kill that tree. I already know it. I'm still getting fruit off of it, though. I'm going to wait till it dies. <laughs> Strong winds are hard on fruit trees. Canyon wind coming down, buffeting those fruit trees. You could plant a windbreak. Or if you have a slope away from the wind, it's protected in there. That's a good spot. Most of your fruit tree is not above ground. Actually, most of it's below ground, and it's very important what's going on below ground. You have the feeder roots right underneath, competing with those grass and forb roots. That's where most of the nutrients are taken up. A lot of water, and you have the anchoring roots. And you have these wonderful things called mycorrhizae that are fungi that make connections between the roots and the nutrients. You want to feed your soil, organic matter on top, encourage those mycorrhizae. This is kind of a neat site, free online. You can find out your soil type. You go to this site and you go through and you can generate a little personal map of your property with all the soil types on it and then read about the soil types. Then, along the theme of soil, test it. Find out what its pH is. What does it have too much of? 
What does it have? Not enough of. Some things are easy to amend. Some things you're just going to live with. But you'll, at least you'll know what the tree is dealing with. There are some deficiencies uh, that can show up. And, and you'll know. You'll know that, ah, oh, maybe that's a likelihood. People who are really serious about their orchards improve the soil before they plant the tree, like the year before they plant the tree. They might put in a cover crop and then dig it in in end of summer, plant a winter cover crop, dig that in two weeks before they're going, they intend to plant their tree. I didn't. My trees are not doing as well as somebody who did that. Their trees would do really well. Get rid of the weeds before you plant. Herbicides and fruit trees do not go well together. Um, in fact, a lawn that you're going to weed and feed and water all summer long is not really a good place for a fruit tree. Uh, we like to get rid of the weeds by covering them. We starve them of sunlight. And this is a good place for recovery and recycling. You can use cardboard. This is a, up here is a piece of geotex. It's kind of like a black felt fabric. That was a, this piece was originally un, it used as somebody's pond liner. And we just use it. It's got logs on it so that uh, it doesn't blow away. Cover them for a year or two. There's actually hawkweed underneath that. And then once you've got a nice little bear splice place, uh, bear place, yeah, plant what you do want to grow there. Maybe pasture mix or clover would be an excellent choice beneath your fruit trees. Oh boy, fruit trees, they are not self-fertile except for a few exceptions that we will talk about. Uh, apples are definitely not self-fertile. So they have to cross-pollinate with another variety. You can't just plant one kind of apple. You have to have two or three kinds of apples. This is a picture of an apple flower and an apple fruit that develops out of that flower. All of that tissue is mother tree tissue, except for the pollen in the anthers and the ovules in the ovary. When you develop the apple, all of this is mother tree tissue. That's why you can plant a blue pearmain tree and get blue pearmain apples. Only the seeds are the next generation of, who knows, their own variety, actually. In fruit trees, there are pollen incompatibility groups. Plants in the rose family are so invested in cross-pollination that they even have genetic mechanisms to prevent self-pollination. Uh, agri agricultural researchers make lists of varieties that won't pollinate with each other. I'll be giving you some information about how to find those things. It's big in cherries, plums, even apples have them. But we don't talk about them much because there's such a variety of apples that we can plant. And, uh, but that is one reason that, like, say, a big commercial grower might include crab apples in among the apples because crab apples are not closely related to his desirable variety. If a, okay, apples are sometimes described as tri triploid. That means they've got three chromosomes, not two, two of everything. They've got three of everything. It's really hard to divide that three into two equal parts that um, are the same number. Essentially, the pollen is sterile. Only like one in less than 300 are fertile. There's a lot of desirable apples that are triploids, though. It seems to give an advantage to the tree. If you want a triploid variety, you just have to plant an extra tree, but hey, Trees are great. Insects do all the heavy, busy work of carrying pollen from tree to tree. There are honeybees are great, but even better are the native pollinators. Last year, I had um, I didn't see any honeybees on any of my apples or other trees until the last week of pollination. Nobody was growing at honeybees near me, but I had a full crop because these guys were busy at work. The trees were humming. Okay, what do you have in mind? Do you have in mind, oh, 
I think I'll just put a couple of trees, one, two, three, widely spaced. You don't need to worry about spacing. Do you have in mind the traditional type freestanding trees, whether it's the central leader or the vase type in rows? Then you have to figure out the spacing between trees and between rows. Or are you going to really go for it? Have 1,000 to 2,000 trees per acre with a high density system. You can grow those organically. You need to decide, and there's advantages and disadvantages, always, but that's something you need to decide. And this, this table, you can't read it, I realize, but you can go to the source. It's on your handout. Go to the source and look at that. That kind of gives you just a little information. Research it more. Whatever you decide to do, research it more. You've got to plan in advance how you're going to water the trees. We put our trees in and we go, oh, we do have to water them, don't we? Uh, we've tried soaker hoses, and my favorite way is, I'm out in the garden anyway, look, I'm out there weeding, or doing something, I just get, have a timer in my pocket, and I get up and I move the hose every now and then, it's cause, and I enjoy it. But I am watering only on the drip line. I never water the base of the tree, because that would set that tree up for root rot. Besides which, the actively absorbing parts of the tree are out here. The feeder roots are out here. That's just the trunk. I also don't want to water my leaves. That opens the door to fungal infections. There are hundreds of varieties available. You get to looking, oh, there are thousands of apple varieties. There are hundreds of cherry varieties. There are hundreds of plum varieties. You have a lot of choice. And whether you're going to go to the local nursery and buy a potted plant, or you're going to order off the catalog or the internet and get a bare root in the mail, plant dormant. For one thing, even the nurseries have better selection early in the spring. And, that, and a dormant tree is not going to undergo the transplant shock that an actively growing tree is. They can do bare root in the male because it's dormant. Just keep the roots moist and it's perfectly good. I ordered in January. I expect it in April. And if you can't plant it right away, you heal it in. And by healing it in, that means sort of like temporarily planting. No fussy planting. Temporarily putting it in with something moist, some moist growing medium. And um, you might even, uh, a lot of people do it outside. I prefer to do it in a large tote with potting soil or glacier gold or something in it. I don't want it wet. I just want it moist. I want to keep the, the tree alive. And then I can put it in my garage where it won't freeze until I plant it. But I don't hold it for more than two weeks. Getting ready to plant, get organized. Hydrate your tree. If it's bare root, I soak it in a bucket of water. If it's uh, if it was a potted plant, I just make sure there's no dry pockets in that plant. You, you get the entire root ball uh, wet. Pruners, my pruners are usually somewhere where I used them last. Find them, because you're going to need them to, to cut off those broken or extra long roots. Then if you're going to add anything to the soil, this is the only time I use commercial fertilizer. I let's don't do that. I did do the, the mycelium inoculum once and it worked really well. Those are healthy, healthy trees. But I feel like my soil is a sort of like an old pasture, a lot of trees around. It's got some mycorrhizae. And then I have to put a bucket of compost in. Um, not ideal, but I have so many rocks. I grow rocks. I have to take some of them out so that I can work there. In fact, I need a pick to dig. The hole, you're going to dig a hole that's like two and a half to three feet wide. Big hole. It has to be two to three times the size of the root mass. Then I take my shovel. This is fun, you know. This is really, get some aggression out. I'm going to take my shovel edgewise, and I'm going to work around the edge of the hole and make cracks and crevices 
for my roots to escape the hole, because the hole is a temporary place. The roots have to get out of that hole and root into the surrounding soil, get their nutrients outside the hole. And then uh, I like to make that little cone. It's a funny looking little cone in that picture. A little cone of soil at the base. Then when I'm planting, I can set my tree on that, and I can check to see that there's room enough, that I, did I dig a big enough hole and take it out if I didn't. And I can, um, it just makes it easier. It also it gives me a little guide for spreading the roots when I get around to that part. And the next, I'm going to fill in the hole. I double check. I have dug a tree up again because I didn't do something right. It's not good. I double check. My graft is four inches above the soil line. Because what good does my rootstock do if I bury my graft? Um, well, it does do some good. Uh, and then you mix whatever you're going to mix in to the soil, you mix it in. And you start filling in. Usually my husband shovels it in while I arrange the roots, and I want to spread them. If a potted plant is root-bound, then it is better to cut the roots, those circling roots off, or to tease them out. Because actually, if a root is circling around in that hole, as it grows bigger and bigger and bigger, it could kind of strangle the tree. No air pockets. Make sure there's no air pockets. He, he puts the, the soil in, I spread the roots, and I water, and I kind of keep that soil puddled. And, and another reason for watering is that it helps wash the soil in among the roots. And then after it's all done, the soil's kind of puddling there, and I just kind of go down and I make sure there's good air contact, no, po air, no air pockets. This is from that handout. Um, it, this is from um, that publication the egg extension publication I mentioned earlier. Notice where they've got the stakes. Whether they're temporary stakes or permanent stakes, you don't want them going down through those roots you just planted. Put them off to the side a little bit. And if you are going to put ties, um, what I use is old nylons or strips of, or wide strips of fabric. And you kind of make a figure eight so that you don't have anything girdling that tree. First pruning. This is from another egg extension uh, publication available free online. All you have to do is download it. This will be your first year pruning for a traditional tree. Now, if you're using a high density system, you may have be doing something different. But for the trees in my the first pruning, as all I do is I head it off like about this high. Actually, I kind of go like go back a fourth of the way down. It depends on the size of my whip. And the reason you make that heading cut is to make sure that your roots and your top are kind of in balance. The roots have just been transported. No matter what you've, where you got the tree, the roots have been transported. They need to do a little growing to support that top. And also you want to encourage scaffold branches. So this might be the second year or as, or as you go through the summer. Sorry about that. Protection. Ah, before you leave that tree, you need to give it some protection. Now. This is just those little white plastic guards in the winter. But that is a form of protection from voles. And I don't worry about it except in winter. But when we first started, my husband didn't want a fence. So we put wire cages around the trees. But then you have to get a bigger wire cage and a bigger wire cage. And they kind of outgrow it. And they're kind of a hassle. Sooner or later, that eight foot fence is so nice. <laughs> These two trees are of about the same age. And it's to scale. This tree was planted a couple of years later. It's a, these are cherries. Uh, but the family dog was home alone and very bored, and she almost girdled that tree. You have to protect from the family dog, too. Hair over the summer, watering is very important. Uh, especially for the first few years, go out there every week and feel the soil. Make sure it doesn't dry out. Its roots are so tiny, and it has just such a small area that it's, that it's tapping water from. My older trees, I check by the about, I water them about every other week. I don't worry about them so much. But then in late August, you're going to taper off watering. Because you don't want that tree to, to continue growing actively. 
a tree that is act green and actively growing in October is going to be a dead tree one of these days. In fact, I had a pink pearl that I absolutely loved, but it didn't harden off, and it is no more. In early summer, I, get, I don't use commercial fertilizer. And in fact, I should have mentioned when we were talking about planting, never put dry fertilizer or fresh manure in the hole with your tree, because it will burn the roots. I don't like to use commercial fertilizer because I had a brush with fire blight. And commercial, that high nitrogen fertilizer causes a lot of excess growth, and excess, that green, lush excess growth is very susceptible to fire blight. So now I don't fertilize my trees. I just give them a, some wood chips. Some, uh, the ramial wood chips are um, chipped from deciduous, not coniferous trees. Anything that's two inches across or less, like everything I prune off in my orchard when I'm pruning in March, we can chip and I can put it around the trees, but I never have enough. You can use maples, you can use snowberry, you can use anything that's deciduous on your place. Um, but I do like to go, I, I mean, I got a lot of weeds in my garden, lots of weeds. I just fill the wheelbarrow full of weeds and I go put it down here and there on the drip line and I feed the tree that way. I, I have lots, of, I have excellent growth. I don't need to add commercial fertilizer. Uh, my husband loves to mow the grass. But you can let it get taller and then come through and mow, mow it. But you probably want to mow it a few times during the summer to cut down on rodent habitat. And just watch. You know, truly, the best fertilizer for your orchard is you out there walking around, looking, keeping an eye on what's going on out there. Winterizing? September. My last chores in the garden, in the orchard. I'm going to do a final cleanup. I'm going to pull back any mulch, any of those pile. If any of those piles of, uh, are left, I kind of flatten them out and spread them. But usually, there's hardly anything left. They all breaks down. Cut the weeds, flush with the soil. You don't want to pull them and disturb the feeder roots. I go. I have older trees too, so I have to go around and pick up every single apple that fell, or if there's still an apple on the tree that was hidden by the leaves, I have to go out and take that down because I don't want any disease or insects overwintering, overwintering in those apples. Um, and then I, you know, as apple trees grow, especially it's the apple trees, they grow bigger and the bark, outer bark cracks and it kind of flakes and it gets kind of big flakes and it makes perfect hiding places for those insects I don't want. So I put on heavy gloves and I go out there and I rub the tree up and down Sometimes I take something else to do it with because it's a little easy, easier. But you can see this is where I've rubbed. This is where I stopped. And there's lichen and flaky stuff. And while I'm doing that, sometimes I see something I don't want to see. I found two trees with boars last year. And so then I got a sharp implement. Actually, I used my grass cutters. This person is using a, a screwdriver and you dig them out and you destroy them because the, it, and it's crude. You feel like, oh, I'm hurting my tree, but he's going to hurt it a lot more. Your tree will recover. Can more winter. I don't. Oh. You can, uh, in here, he would recommend fresh manure and clay oh. um, or neem oil, actually neem oil. Because that, if there's any insects left in there, that will interrupt their um, um, their ability to change into a pupa. It'll interrupt their growth. And it's not like it kills them outright. It, okay, more winterizing. Oh, paint the fruit trunks with a one-to-one -one mixture of white. Indoor, never outdoor. Indoor, latex paint and water, and that perhaps prevents sun scald in the winter time. You have this beautiful dark tree trunk, and the sun is at a low angle, and it just hits that tree right. So the trunk warms up, and it begins to be physiologically active. And you got water in there, fresh, free water, and it freezes at night, and it causes damage. So I paint my tree trunks white. Somebody who's 
uh, certified organic, wouldn't be able to use the latex paint. There are some other things you can use, but um, yeah. So I do that, and then I put on the plastic road guards. I've never had any problems with, I mean, I know I've got voles out there. I can see the little trails, but I've never lost. But then I'm careful about that. I've got a lot of those little things. The worst, to me, the worst apple, the insect pests in the orchard are the boars. I never see the adults, but occasionally I do see the, where they have been eaten in my tree and, and see the larvae. They will kill a tree. I've lost a couple of trees to that. Useful equipment. I really like my pruners. I really like my tripod ladder, my orchard ladder. This is an extension bypass pruner that my daughter has. And here she's holding a, a uh, it's, it's like a little let's pick it, pole harvester. Yeah, you buy it as this little orange, kind of like flat, flat basket. You put it on the end of your own pole. And you can reach things that you can't reach from the top of your ladder. I've got some big trees. Uh, she's also wearing a picking bag. This is like this heavy canvas bag. They're about $50. And, and, but they're really shaped like a long tube with the sides fastened up. So after you're, you're on your ladder and you pick and fill your bag till your aren't, shoulders are kind of feeling heavy, you get down and you hold it open over the crate, undo the sides, and they flow gently. Gently down. Apples. And some of the excess that I couldn't get in the apple shed last year. Apples have to cross-pollinate. You're going to need two to three different varieties. The descriptions will always say, oh, this blooms early. This is mid-early. This is mid, mid or late mid or late. To tell the truth, in my orchard, there are some that, bur that bloom early. They are the first ones out there going. And then a week later, everybody's there. And then, and then there's some that kind of get slow start and they're late. Don't get hung up. I mean, it's important, but don't get hung up on it. Pick varieties that are likely to overlap and you'll do fine. Especially if you increase the number of varieties. Who can live with just two or three? Biennial bearing. This is a problem. I'm way past my notes. This is a problem uh, mostly in apple trees, especially some of the older varieties. They tend to do this. They are so busy giving you a bumper crop, ripening all those seeds, that when late summer comes, they fail to make next year's flower buds. So you get nothing, or just a few. And then the next year, you get another bumper crop. Uh, one of the solutions to this is to go out there and thin the extra fruit that's developing. After it blooms, there'll be about two weeks when the tree itself is culling anything that didn't get properly pollinated or somehow the tree knows he's got an insect in him. They will also, a lot of the, the things that it culls off will be insect, like codling moth contaminated. Uh, but then, after those two weeks, you can go out there and you can pick up. I've, I've really, been really bad at doing this because I just retired. I was busy working and I didn't have time. But you can, you can thin it so, so that it's, they're four to seven inches apart. Not only do you cut down on the biennial bearing, but it'll be bigger fruit. It works really well whenever I've taken the time to do it. You get bigger, sweeter fruit. If a tree is just plastered with lots of little fruit, it's probably not going to bear next year. And also, you've just got more to, more to handle. Might as well thin them. Pick up the thinnings, though, off the ground. There's no sense leaving them there for that little worm to crawl out and up the trunk and into another apple, and they will. Compost in a hot pile or discard in the garbage. Oh, here are some of the many wonderful summer apples. Being up here is no, doesn't mean that it's better than any other variety. It just means that there's tons of them. 
and I could only get so many on the slide. Some of the wonderful September apples. Anything that ripens after that first week in October is probably not going to ripen here. So when you're reading a variety description and it says November, it's not for you, us. It won't ripen here. Um, and some of the good ones are. And how long will an apple keep? That's the next slide. Some of these summer apples, they're only going to keep up to a month, maybe two. The, the uh, apples that ripen in October, August um, just are not good keepers. Yellow transparent, you pick slightly green and you use it within a week or you give it away. But it makes wonderful sauce and pie. Okay. September apples might keep two to three months. Except Honeycrisp and Fiesta will keep five to six months for me. And I have lousy storage conditions. Optimum storage conditions are like 90 to 95 percent humidity uh, at uh, almost freezing or just to 40 degrees. A little bit of air circulation so that you get rid of the ethylene and the carbon dioxide. The winter apples that we can't grow here are the best <laughs> for storing. Have okay. Tried, have you tried grabbing steams here at all? It's a young one. Yeah, are they working? Oh, yeah, it's growing. I, in fact, my neighbor has a Gramenstein. It's, it's, it's a wonderful tree. Triploid. Okay, when you talk about a, okay, when you talk about a fresh eating apple, in the catalog they're going to describe it as a dessert apple. Not something that you put in a pie, but something that you eat fresh. Applesauce, yellow, transparent, and early gold are wonderful <coughs> flavor. Wonderful. State Fair is another favorite of mine. It makes a delicately pink applesauce. Unnamed New York experimental variety makes fuchsia colored applesauce. It looks like you put beets in it, but you didn't. It's just apples and water. Pie, are pies your thing? Old timers really loved yellow transparent because the skin, it's mushy. It makes a mushy pie, but the skin is so thin you didn't have to peel it. It just kind of dissolves. Northern Lights and Duchess of Oldenburg are my favorite pie apples. My Gravenstein's too young. It hasn't, it's not producing yet. But um, it's famous. There's a lot of good pie ones out there. So is Bramley. But uh, good for everything? It's very much a matter of personal opinion. In the catalogs, they have these little tables. You know, and they'll list the varieties, and they'll list what it's good for. And some varieties have everything checked, but just because you can use it for that doesn't mean that it's the variety you're going to choose for that. But I do know people who swear by Wealthy and Gravenstein say you can use it for everything. The only thing is neither one of them stores very well. Blue Permain has every box checked. It's an excellent baking apple. It's also one of the most beautiful apples you'll ever see. But um, I wouldn't use it for everything. Disease resistant apples, yes, they are out there. Old ones and new ones. But you have to treat disease resistant apples with as much care as you treat your susceptible ones. Because, um, as an example, I have a Liberty. It's supposed to be practically immune to scab. It got plastered last year, and only a little bit of scab on its neighbors. My yellow transparent has never had it. But it's supposed to be susceptible. This is an article from Purdue University about managing disease-resistant varieties, just emphasizing what I just said. Rootstock, very important in apples. The, the top, the variety on top, gets all the glamorous press. I mean, we talk about, oh, that great tasting apple. But what's underneath is the foundation of the tree. It's very important. The dwarfing rootstocks do it by limiting the vigor of the top. If you, want, if you want a tree that you can pick just standing on the ground, no ladder, bears in two to three years, 
You don't particularly care if it lives more than 20 years. It's okay. You really might want a dwarfing rootstock. If you want a big, full-size tree that, um, that you're going to need a good, tall ladder and, and a good pair of pruning pruners to keep in check, you don't care if it takes 7 to 12 years to eat, get its first fruit. But you're in there, you want that tree, a tr to plant a tree that's going to last generations, 200 years, easy. Then you might want to, I should say 100 years, easy. Uh, you might want to plant a full-size Antonovka seedling rootstock. If you want the best of both worlds, sort of a compromise, there's these wonderful semi-dwarfs. Right there in the middle, um, they're going to get some. They, they they give a different range in heights, and you can see here. Uh, this table shows the height is 20 to 24. Each top comes with its own vigor, so that dwarfingness affects each tree a little bit differently. And then this would be the spacing in a row. Um, we have tried most of the ones on here, except the Geneva one at the top. It came out a little bit after we <coughs> planted most of our trees. This is my favorite rootstock. It's very hardy. It's going to be 80 to 85, 80 to 90 percent of full size, but I can control it with my pruners. I head it back. Um, it's, and it bears a lot earlier than this guy's going to bear. So far it's a, it's a, it's a very healthy tree. This is another way to look at rootstocks by the percent of dwarfing that they do. Here's Antonovka seedling over here, it's 100%. Budogovsky, 9, and Geneva, 11, are only going to give you a tree that's 40% of the normal size for that variety. Fire blight is the worst disease on apples. You'll notice that real characteristic shepherd's crook, die back. Look for this, like say in June, when we got that warm, wet weather between 75 and 85 degrees. Um, it's a bacteria that gets into the blossoms, straight line to the vascular system. If you see it, you're going to want to prune that out and destroy what you burn it or bag it and throw it in the garbage because that stuff is bad news for an orchard. I've only had a brush with fire blight twice. It was very minimal on a couple of trees. I pruned them out. I ha and then I stopped using nitrogen fertilizer. And I haven't had a problem since. Because I don't have that excessive growth. <laughs> My trees are in it for the slow, long haul. I still get plenty of new growth. I just don't have the, the major new growth. Cut it off. You can see on my diagram, I've got the little brown shepherd's crook. I've got another little branchlet that's kind of drooping, beginning to droop. The leaves are green, but they're kind of looking wet and wilted. And I've got some healthy growth. I cut it off right next to the stem behind where I've got healthy growth. If, 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 if that tree, if that branch had gone, let's see, all the way back, back to there, I might take it off up here. This is an excellent resource out of California about dealing with fire blight. And, if, and especially if you have a canker on the trunk of your tree, it talks about how to get rid of it by scraping it off in the winter when the tree's dormant. Apple scab starts little and grows, and it can get ugly. That's what my Liberty apple looked like last year. It was ugly. Rake up those infected leaves when they fall in the ground in the fall. Rake them up. Uh, I composted them, or you could burn them, but I, I need every bit of uh, organic matter off of my, my little hobby farm that I can get. So I composted them, and I'm going to put that compost in my vegetable garden. I'm not going to put it on my trees, just to be on the safe side. Oh, and also it said it prune in the spring for an open canopy with good air movement. That's the best way to defeat those fungi, have good air movement so that dries, the leaves dry up. Wormy apples. Um, 
They overwinter as mature pupae in the little cocoons in the soil, and crevices on the bark. So that's why I'm out there doing this with the bark. Adults merge at bloom time, and then they're out there at dawn and dusk laying eggs. And there's more than one cycle in the summertime. Control them early so that they don't hit you hard again uh, the middle of summer. In fact, there can be three. And it's that third one doesn't mature, but they can try. To do it, okay, pick up all those little immature fruit dropped off the tree. Just rake them up. Get rid of them, because a lot of them might have little worms in them. And there's no sense letting them get back up in the tree. Remove the fruit. Oh, remove and dispose of young infected fruit when you're thinning. Uh, and then in May, you can get strips of cardboard and kind of rip it open so you get the corrugations. And you're going to tape it with the corrugations up against the tree trunk and just tape it on. I've seen ones, this source, they, they've got it head height where the, where the branches are. I've not seen another source that says do it low down on the trunk. You can do it more than one. Then you're going to look at it, peek in there and see if you've got anybody in your larvae hotel and remove it in June and destroy it. Then put it back on because anybody you didn't catch is going to be doing a new crap crop of larvae middle of summer. And you can keep doing this. Anybody, anybody you catch means hundreds of apples that don't have worms in them. Pears. There are European pears and Asian pears. Uh, European pears do particularly well here. They are strong, vigorous trees that can be 50 feet tall in the wild. The rootstock that they usually come on can be up to 20 feet tall. Keep them to a manageable height. You do need two varieties for pollination, seckle and barlet. Well, do it for each other. Pick the fruit when it's physiologically ripe. It's ripe enough that it is capable of ripening off the tree. You don't ever pick it tree ripe. If you pick it too early, it will be astringent and never ripen. If you pick it too late, it is brown and mushy inside. How, do, how to uh, decide if it's ripe or not? I, I think the best thing to do is to know your pear tree, to watch it from one year to the next, and, and go out there every week and feel the fruit, feel the waxiness. Lenticels are the little tiny pores. There are little brown specks on here. Get a magnifying glass and look at them. It's a really cool. They'll, they'll, they're white when that, when that fruit is very immature, but as it grows, they'll turn tan and then they'll turn brown. It gives that sort of russeting effect. And then the final test is, like I say, this is your pear. It's going to ripen from the center out. Push down right next to that stem and see if there's just a little bit of give. Then it's time. And they should come off easily. It's always an art when we pick our pears. Asian pears, they grow here. But you're going to pick them when they are tree ripe, when the seeds are black. They are self-fertile, partially self-fertile, but they do do better with a different variety. Sometimes a European pear will pollen, you know, if you can get it so that it's blooming at the right time, it can provide the pollen for the Asian pear. They are both pears after all. Sweet cherries, they're very productive. You're going to eat them or process them right away. They don't keep, and you're going to give a bunch away if anybody will take them. Um, you need two varieties for pollination, and pollination Com incompatibility groups are big in cherries. These two resources have lists of varieties and the whatever and what pollination group they're in. They cannot pollinate anybody in the same group that they are in because they have the same genetics. There are some new self-fertile cherries. Actually, these aren't that new, but they have some even newer ones. And processing. The big thing with cherries, though, oh, and Pie cherries, and you know what? Pie cherries are terrific dried. I have them in my oatmeal in the morning. Um, all cherries are susceptible to those fruit flies. If you don't want to deal with fruit flies, double think even having a cherry tree, because you need to. You need to deal with your fruit flies. We also have, it's, this is an invasive species called spotted wing drosophila. 
And you see on the end of that male Drosophilus um, wings, there's those little spots. That's the. These are different than the regular fruit flies that we have in the in the kitchen because they're related, but these go after fresh fruit. They not only go after cherries, they go after your raspberries, they go after your blueberries and your strawberries. They're bad news. Control is based on interrupting the life cycle. They have a similar life cycle, but the Drosophila overwinters as an adult, and it, it only takes 7 to 20 days to go through its life cycle. It's bad news. The, the cherry fruit pie overwinters. It's a little pupae in the ground. The adult emerges in the mid-May. You can trap them. They lay their eggs. They get up there. They got the maggots. You pick every single cherry off of your trees. You pick all those cherries up off the ground. You don't leave anything to, to provide maggots for next year. So you pick. And then, if you did get a few in the ground, you could, I've seen where they, they put um, ground cloth on the ground. So when the, the larvae drop out of the trees to pupate, they catch them so they can't get to the soil to overwinter. Or you could spray the soil with neem oil, or you could let your chickens out there eat those pupae. They're tiny, but they could find them. Good resource, and just, just recaps everything. Oh, when I dispose of my rotten fruit, or any of the pits from when I'm processing my cherries, I put them all in a tote, fill them with water to cover, put the lid on good, and put it in the sun and walk away for two or three weeks. Then I can put it in the, chicken, the compost pile in with the chickens. But I make sure everybody drowns or ferments. I hate them. Doing this re re religiously, you can get rid of an infestation in three years to nothing. You can keep an infestation from even happening. This is a resource that tells you how to make this trap. This is the trap from this book. He suggests a soda bottle. I like to use a small uh, water bottle because um, it's got this, doesn't it look like a giant oversized cherry? <laughs> this looks a little more like a cherry. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to make them think that this is where they want to lay their eggs. And so then you, he suggests that you coat it with um, tangle trap. But you're going to put two different solutions in here. Mid-May to June, you're going to put in a solution of ammonia and water. And it was my idea to put in the deter unscented detergent because I want them to drown. But uh, what you're doing is mimicking the smell of the fresh bird manure, bird poop, that they like to eat before they start laying eggs. Then in mid-June, when your cherries are starting to, to show a little color, you're going to dump that and you're going to pull it in re weekly. You're going to dump that and start putting in a different solution. Because now you want to mimic the smell of ripe, ripe cherries. So you're going to use a mixture of real apple cider vinegar and sugar water. Oh, it's so ripe, it's fermenting. OK. One final word on cherries. They're toxic. All parts of the tree except that fruit are toxic. You don't eat the crushed pits. You don't, uh, they're bitter. But, and you don't let livestock brow, browse on pruned branches. Cyanide. Two types of plums that we're successful with here in Montana. There are the European plums, like green gauge, uh, prune plum, and mirabelles. Mirabelles are tiny, but they are so sweet. Or you have the Japanese-American hybrids. Uh, they're complex hybrids. Uh, pure Japanese would not be hardy enough here, but the American. Adds, oh, I'm going to have to go very quickly. I had too much fun. I'm sorry. Uh, but it's all here, picking plum diseases. I haven't had any problems, but that's a good resource. Apricots, I really, I like, I love apricots. They are self-fertile, usually. There's a few that aren't. 
look for varieties with hardiness, late bloom, and disease resistance. And the disease to look for is brown rot. It gets in the flowers and it goes in the vascular system. And that's another disease and some possible apricot varieties. And at the very end, these are nurseries that I have ordered from and, and really enjoy. There's lots of great ones out there, though. Questions? And we need to get out the door because people want to come in. Well, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.